This is Winchester Academy. Okay, there we go. All right, good. All right, so can everyone hear me all right? Yes. Good? Okay, very good. Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, as was mentioned, I uh, came here the first several times and did what really my research, uh, central research interests are in the Civil War, and I did several topics on that. And at some point, I wanted to sort of break out, so you may remember I came last year and talked about Audubon and the Birds of America, because bird watching is another interest of mine. And from a very early age, such an early age that I can't really tell you how it started, I've always been fascinated with railroads. So tonight, I wanted to bring together my interest in history and in railroads and tell you a little bit about the Transcontinental Railroad and some stories about it. I will say, I've had to pare this down. I did this for in another forum and I, I did a four and a half ver hour version of this. <laughs> now before I have to start handing out oxygen, I understand our limits tonight, which is now not be the four and a half hour version, but there are endless interesting stories about the building of the first Transcontinental Railroad uh, across the United States long ago and it just occurs to me that I did not somehow get the mouse which I'm going to need to advance here we go to advance the uh, all right to advance the slide so let me grab that very quickly all right and if it's on and working let's see how this works okay first of all excellent some basics uh, for those, I think many people are familiar with the Transcontinental Railroad, but those who aren't, let me begin with a couple of basic uh, facts. First of all, it was not truly a Transcontinental Railroad, although it did link existing railroad mileage with the west coast of the United States, which was, of course, its purpose. Uh, created by the 1862 Pacific Railroad Act, uh, the railroad was to go from Omaha to Sacramento, a distance of 1,912 miles. The group working from the west was called the Central Pacific. They would work east from Sacramento, the Union Pacific west from Omaha, uh, and they, were to, they would eventually meet in 1869 at a place called Promontory Summit, Utah. Not Promontory Point, but Promontory Summit, Utah. A little bit more about that later. And as you may well know, this is the iconic photograph of that moment, perhaps one of the most important and famous photographs in American history, that when we talk about this linking of the rails, this is the image that most people have in their minds. It is, in the end, that iconic photo. Well, railroads. Nowadays, they are not the center of our economy the way they once were, but they played a huge role, particularly in 19th and early 20th century America. But one thing to remember was that in the 1860s, railroads were not yet that old. They had really only begun in the late 1820s. Um, here I have a, this is the laying of the first, sort of the cornerstone of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad on July 4th, 1828. For that occasion, they brought out the last living signer of the Declaration of Independence, Charles Carroll of Carrollton, uh, seen there holding a shovel, and they had him dig some dirt. They understood the historical significance tying the American Revolution with this new and burgeoning and, ex and expanding United States. And so they brought him out. I always felt it was a terrible thing to do to a man of advanced age was to bring him out on a cold day and make him shovel a little dirt. Um, not to worry, he lived four more years. So this, was, this did not do him in. He was in quite good health and lasted quite a while. Uh, but after the death of uh, Jefferson and Adams, uh, who both died on July 4th, 1826, you may or may not know, um, he was the last survivor. So the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, one of the first important long distance railroads in American history. And when we think of the railroads, even by modern standards, uh, it looked a little different. This is an early conception of what the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad thought its trains would look like. Uh, early on in the, in the mid 1820s, originally they had planned to pull, the, pull them by horses. Uh, only in the late 1820s did the steam engine start to become feasible. But even when with steam engines and some rudimentary, you can see that that passenger car, even without the second deck, is essentially just uh, a stagecoach put on wheels, right? Um, but even with those rudimentary designs, 
it took a while for railroads to take off. They, they faced certain problems that American business had never failed, faced before, uh, problems of capitalization. One had to invest hundreds of thousands and indeed millions of dollars in a railroad before you earned your first dollar of revenue. And so it took a vast investment of capital, often sometimes British capital, and the British were not always so certain that these Americans knew what they were doing, building all these crazy railroad miles. And so that took a while. A railroad also required a level of organization never called for before. If you think of other American businesses at the time, even large ones like textile mills in New England, if you were the manager of that textile mill, you could stand and see your entire business in one moment. You can't do that with a railroad. It is 20 yards wide and 200 miles long. You need a system of officers and reports and communication to make that work. Railroads learn things from the military and how to do, how to organize uh, forces that are dispersed over space. And of course, the telegraph in the 1840s greatly aided in communication as far as the development of railroads. Uh, early on, there was a railroading boom in the 1830s where Illinois nearly bankrupted the state by trying to engage in a canal and railroading, uh, railroad building boom. But by 1840, there was not much to show for it. Um, those little lines, and of course not the state lines, but those other little lines represent railroads in operation in the United States in 1840. And you can see that there's just the beginning of maybe a little bit of a line along the East Coast, but almost the rest of them were very isolated and very small. Uh, my proof of how the 1850s and 1860s really were the takeoff for railroads is shown by this. Um, Railroads that existed by 1850 are there in black. Railroads that existed by 1860 are in red. So you can see that it's really the 1850s where a simple national railroad network began to emerge and railroads began to go into remote places like Wisconsin for the first time, as you can see there uh, on that map. Yet even though railroads had all sorts of problems with equipment and capitalization and organization, that is not, however, to say that there were not dreamers out there. As early as 1832, a man named Dr. Hartwell Carver had proposed the idea of a transcontinental railroad. Uh, he formally published this in a pamphlet in 1847. One thing I would point out is that in 1832 and yet even in 1847, the United States did not yet extend to the Pacific. And so, indeed, they were dreamers. It was only in 1848 that the United States would complete its movement across the continent in a way I'll show you in a minute. And yet, there were already Americans who said, we are destined, if you think about Manifest Destiny, they were destined to expand to the Pacific, and railroads are the means that are going to tie the nation together and allow goods and people to move around the country. And so, Early on, there were three proposed routes for a transcontinental railroad. Uh, there was a northern route, which was very quickly abandoned because, um, well, winter. Uh, you can see the, <laughs> I, I could give you a long and complicated story about the northern route, but imagine pushing through those uh, mountain passes in winter through the bitter routes and the like. So that was seen, and Duluth was not yet Duluth really in a modern sense, so it was not a natural eastern terminus as Chicago or, as you can see, New Orleans would appear to be. So the real competitors for the transcontinental route were a southern route and a central route. Uh, Southerners, not surprisingly, very much favored the New Orleans to San Francisco route, the so-called southern route. And they so believed in this route and the importance in giving the South that transcontinental railroad that they engaged in what many of you may know is the great trivia question of American history. Why in the world did the United States buy that tiny little piece of southern Arizona and New Mexico called the Gadsden Purchase in 1853 from Mexico? And the answer is because that was the best route for the southern transcontinental railroad. And so it was purchased to build a railroad. That's why the Gadsden Purchase was there. Um, that southern route was favored by southerners. Many northerners favored the central route that would begin in existing rail traffic through Chicago, head west to Omaha, and then would have to be extended from Omaha west to Sacramento. In some ways, 
this debate about a southern and central route could not be resolved until the Civil War when southerners, by removing themselves from the United States Congress, lost all influence in what that route would be. Um, I should say, though, before we get to that central route, that there was a competitive idea, which isn't really in color here, but that would have started from St. Joseph, Missouri, and gone west. And that that may seem odd, since many of you may say, well, St. Joseph, that doesn't seem to be the most important uh, place. Well, if you look at this railroad map, it becomes more obvious, perhaps, why St. Joseph, Missouri would be the eastern terminus of the Transcontinental Railroad, because as you can see, that was in many ways by far the furthest west rails had gone by 1860. Uh, you may also know, if you know a little bit about western history, that St. Joseph was also the eastern beginning point of the Pony Express. And so many people thought of St. Joseph, Missouri as a jumping off point for a route across uh, the western plains and western mountains uh, to the gold fields of California. So there were those who were saying St. Joseph should be the central route, but there were a lot of influential Midwestern politicians, particularly those from Illinois, uh, not only Abraham Lincoln, but people like Stephen Douglas, who were arguing for a central route, the so-called central route, which eventually would be decided upon this one here that appears in orange and in green. Um, so. As I said, in some ways, it really took the Civil War to get this railroad underway. Uh, they would never decide on what route would be taken as long as Northerners and Southerners remained in the Congress. But once the Civil War was underway, uh, the 37th Congress uh, did, took, undertook a large number of economic measures to put the United States on what it saw as a footing to move forward, uh, things like a national banking and homesteading and also a Pacific Railroad Act. So in 1862, right in the middle of the war, indeed, for those of you who know the Civil War, on the very day in which the Battle of Malvern Hill was concluding the Seven Days Campaign, uh, Congress passed the Pacific Railroad Act, which is what it was always, it is usually called, although, to point out that there is nothing new under the sun, the actual name of the Pacific Railroad Act is, and I quote, an act to aid in the construction of a railroad and telegraph line from the Missouri River to the Pacific Ocean and to secure to the government the use of the same for postal, military, and other purposes. But of course, no one wants to say that over and over again. So very quickly, it became known as the Pacific Railroad Act of 1862. Uh, as previously mentioned, it chartered two corporations. One to be called the Central Pacific, which would begin in Sacramento and would build to the east. A second one called the Union Pacific, which would begin in Omaha and build to the west. Where they would meet would be left up to subsequent construction because no one truly knew what would be involved in building this railroad. There were incentives. The railroads were allowed to issue 30 year 6% bonds uh, to finance the railroad. They would also receive from the government $16,000 per mile for flat land 32,000 for foothills and $48,000 per mile for mountain railroads. The Central Pacific early on uh, engaged just the right geologist to say that the Sierra Range began in what you and I would think of as a very flat floodland plain and began to get that $48,000 very early. Um, but uh, for the most part, that was, of all the corruption I can say that was involved in building these railroads, that was a minor infraction by what, compared to what would come later. Um, the railroads would also receive 10 square miles, that is 6,400 acres, of public land for every mile of rail they graded. And that that would be checkerboarded on both sides of the track with alternating sections left it to be sold to retain as public lands and so that the development of the West could be both uh, railroad and also individual settler sort of driven over time. Early on, one of the real visionaries of the Central Pacific was a man named Theodore Judah. Um, he had first come up with a practical route to move east from Sacramento up through the Sierra Mountains. Uh, he had chartered that course, he had surveyed that route, and he had been the one who had proven that a route east 
from Sacramento was practical given the engineering possibilities of the day. Eventually, he was joined by four investors who came to be called the Big Four. Here they are, Crocker, Huntington, Hopkins, and Stanford. Uh, they eventually came to run the railroad, and each of them played a really critical role that I won't go into uh, in great detail, but each one of them played a part. Eventually, Judah got uh, sidelined. He was pushed aside and sort of lost a lot of control, partly because he said things like, the Sierra Mountains begin where God made them, not in the middle of some pl floodplain 11 miles east. And this, of course, angered the investors in the Central Pacific Railroad because he was, he was potentially costing them tens of, well, $4.8 million, and they were not big fans of that. Imagine, $4.8 million was real money back in the 1860s, right? And so <laughs> it was something really to be said for that. Um, the Central Pacific broke ground in January of 1863 in Sacramento. This is a uh, painting that depicts the moment. They first laid tracks in October of 1863. Union Pacific, meanwhile, did not start laying tracks until July of 1865, heading from the west. In some ways, they both needed the war to be largely over before a lot of rails could be laid, both because of the need for a large amount of iron, they'd be competing with wartime interests, and because of the need for labor, which the end of the war uh, would, make, uh, would, would largely solve. Uh, one of the things that both sides faced from the beginning was that all of the rail for this railroad would have to be U.S. made iron. The congressional delegation from Pennsylvania made sure that that was included in the 1862 Pacific Railroad Act, and they knew they would be the beneficiaries of that. Um, Judah eventually uh, going back east and trying to take control of the railroad, uh, the Central Pacific, away from the investors, uh, caught a fever on the Isthmus of Panama, uh, arrived in New York City in the delirium and died a few days later. So he leaves our story very early. So sadly, he never got to see the, the railroad completed that he had really envisioned and it played such a critical early role for. So most of the rest of the Civil War was, in, was spent in selling stock, in trying to figure out exactly what this supply line would look like uh, once they began to build. In 1865, both railroads began in earnest. Uh, by August, a congressional delegation rode to Central Pacific 50 miles east of Sacramento up into the Sierras and showed them that the Central Pacific was viable. And lest you think that even going a little east of Sacramento was easy, before those first 50 miles were built, they had already faced engineering tasks and tricks like something called Bloomer Cut. This is near Arcade, California, and it still exists to this day. If you look at Google Maps, and if you look in the right place about a mile southwest of downtown Arcade, California, you will see a black strip. And that is because when the satellite is taking imagery, the sun never hits the bottom of Bloomer Cut, except for a very brief period in the middle of the day. And to this day, Union Pacific trains go through that cut. And so that was a major engineering feat that you can just get a sense of from this photograph. They have widened it a little bit. They've shored up the side. But I think that photograph is much more dramatic than anything else that I could possibly um, show you. And how did the Central Pacific manage this? There is no iron making on the west coast of the United States. So everything that the Central Pacific builds east from Sacramento has got to come from the east most of it coming from New York City. One of the big four, Collis Huntington, was the man in New York City who handled the logistics. He was the one who was buying things in the East and then putting them on ships either to go around the tip of South America or across the Isthmus of Panama on their way to Sacramento. And for every mile of track that the Central Pacific laid, they required 100 tons of rail, 2,500 cross ties, which could be made from lumber in the Sierras. That was easier. Two to three tons of spikes and fish plates, those little pieces of metal that hold the rails together. 
They also required flour, bacon, ham, sugar, beans, rice, dried food, fruit for the workers, wheelbarrows, carts, shovels, axes, crowbars, blasting powder. Huntington was buying 10,000 tons of supplies in New York City every month once construction began. It was a miracle that the Central Pacific managed to move as quickly as it did into the Sierra Mountains. And what's ironic is, at least initially, the Union Pacific was slower building from the east. Mm -hmm. President of the Union Pacific, Thomas, well, he was actually vice president, but he controlled the Union Pacific, was Thomas Durant. Um, Durant was always looking for a way to make a little money. For instance, uh, when they began to build the Union Pacific west out of Omaha, he realized that they were being paid for every mile graded and track laid. So instead of a straight line out of Omaha that would include trestles and the like, he followed the contours of the land in oxbows. And so when they were 50 miles west of Omaha by trackage, they were only 33 miles west of Omaha as the crow flew. So um, he really, in, in some ways, if Durant had remained the construction manager of the Union Pacific, one wonders whether it would, in fact, have worked. Um, they also make a show in Union Pacific that they're making, good, uh, they're making good progress in November of 1865. They got none other than General William Tecumseh Sherman, uh, who'd recently sort of wrapped up the Civil War, of course, rode the first 45 miles west of the Union Pacific track, uh, but with somewhat less fanfare than the eastern congressional delegation east from Sacramento, um, he was asked to sit on a nail keg that was on a flat car pulled by an engine. And they went 35 miles west of Omaha and said, look at all the things we've done this year. And they called it the Grand Excursion. Well, I'll leave it to you how grand that excursion was. In 1865, the Union Pacific was only making five and a half miles a month. They needed to make a mile a day in 1866 to really keep up with what they had promised the government to get to the 100th meridian and prove from the detractors that the Union Pacific could build this railroad. And so in 1866, the Union Pacific actually proved itself. Durant put aside his greed for a moment. Don't worry, the greed will be back. But for a moment, he put the greed aside. And he made two really smart decisions. First of all, he convinced an army officer, Major General Grenville Dodge, to leave the army and to become construction supervisor for the Union Pacific. Grenville Dodge was a man who knew how to work men. He was no nonsense. He was out to build the railroad, and construction started on a real pace across the plains of Nebraska in 1866 as it never had before. The second thing that Durant did is he realized that the way they were building the railroad was incredibly inefficient. That materials were stockpiled back near Omaha and had to be brought forward and that until they had a town in between, the workers would go back to the nearest town every night and then had to be brought forward to the railhead every morning. And so in early 1866, he contracted with a pair of Ohio brothers named the Casement Brothers and they created the first construction train. They put together a train that had bunk cars where the men could sleep, flat cars so that the material could go with them, and that, flat, that train stayed at the front every night. It simply parked for the night, and the next day they began building to the west. It was extremely efficient. It was quickly, um, railroads all over the world began to emulate it. This is the Central Pacific wasted no time in copying the same idea on their tracks, and they began doing the same thing. And so between Grenville Dodge and the Casement Brothers construction train, uh, in some ways the Union Pacific really took off in 1866. It also helped, by the way, that Grant and Sherman, uh, now handling the peacetime army of the United States, saw the railroad as a military necessity. And their attention was shifting to the West now that the war was over. And they could see that this would be an important way in which Indians could be defeated and rounded up, and that was an important military means. And they began to put their political clout behind the railroad as well. Before I'm too tough on Thomas Durant, and don't worry, I'm about to be tough on him again, I would say one thing. 
Uh, some of the maps I showed you are very deceptive. It makes it look as if all he had to do was bring supplies west from Chicago, bring them to Omaha, and then start building west. There was no bridge across the, the Missouri River at Omaha. There would not be until 1869, until in fact the railroad was completed. So the supplies coming to Omaha to build west nearly were as complicated as those that Huntington was sending to Sacramento. Supplies had to be sent from New York to New Orleans, mm. then put on ships that went up to St. Louis, then were transloaded onto shallower ships that could go on the boats, that could go on the Missouri River, and then floated up to Omaha and offloaded then to the railhead. So this was no easy thing. But fortunately, again, Durant found Grenville Dodge was the man. They eventually opened another system where they could come out from Chicago and then uh, bring things across a ferry from Quincy, Illinois to Hannibal, Missouri. And they managed to make things a little more efficient by doing that by 1867. So in 1866, the Union Pacific indeed began laying track at one mile a day. By August, they were 200 miles west of Omaha and they faced their first Indian attack at Plum Creek. In October, they had a true grand excursion that found its way out to the 100th meridian. Uh, and by November, they shut down for the season. The trains wintered at where the junction of the North and South Platte Rivers. They created a new town called North Platte, Nebraska. But in 1866, during the winter, it became known colloquially as Hell on Wheels. <laughs> and thereafter, wherever the railhead was, that place where young men with money in their pockets and the people who would like to take that money from their pockets would congregate came to be called Hell on Wheels. There was a show on uh, AMC a few years ago about this that sort of explored that. Um, let's just say, let's without being going to too many sordid details, that young men with a lot of money in their pockets enjoyed drinking, enjoyed gambling, and enjoyed the company of women. And all of those things could be found at Hell on Wheels during the winter of 1866-67. Later it would be Julesburg, Colorado that would be Hell on Wheels for a winter, and later Cheyenne, Wyoming, and Evanston, Wyoming, and finally Corrine, Utah in early 1869. Back to the Central Pacific. The Central Pacific was having a real problem, which I hope these slides can help explain. They now were facing the Sierras. This involved massive fills and a series of 15 tunnels that would be necessary to take the railroad over the Sierra Mountains. Black powder was only making a progress of a few feet a day in those tunnels. In 1866, something new arrived in San Francisco and on the Central Pacific called nitroglycerin. Um, it was being shipped up, and it was much better. It worked when it was wet. If they hit water inside, nitroglycerin still worked. It was more, a more powerful <laughs> explosive, and it turned the rock after explosions into smaller pieces, which made them easier to remove from the tunnel. Nitroglycerin was a godsend to the Central Pacific. They began using it, but you may know one of the things about nitroglycerin is it's not particularly stable. When they began using it, um, this was a brand new item that had just been invented in Germany and, and brought over, and some had been shipped to the Central Pacific and to other places in Sacramento. And people did not yet know about nitroglycerin and the danger of this item. And so a crate containing nitroglycerin was sent to the Wells Fargo office in Sacramento. And it was found to be leaking. And after lunch, some young men decided to open the crate and find out what was leaking out of this crate. The resulting explosion destroyed the building and every building surrounding it and left 15 people dead. And no one fully understood what had happened. A few days later, there was an explosion near the trailhead up on the CP, and people put two and two together and came up with five and blamed the Central Pacific for the explosion in Sacramento. This is actually nitroglycerin headed to other construction companies, but they were to blame. And it became illegal to transport nitroglycerin in California, which would have ruined the Central Pacific. <laughs> 
except at this very moment, a German chemist arrived in Sacramento and said, for a large fee, he would build a nitroglycerin factory at the railhead, would produce it on site, and when, within a few months, the CP was underway again using nitroglycerin and began to blast their way through the Sierras once again. There were 15 tunnels. The longest summit tunnel would be 1,659 feet long. Because of the length, the report of the Central Pacific <laughs> said that they began digging the tunnel at all four ends. <laughs> now, I want to explain that for a minute. Um, lest you think something really strange has happened, here's what they did. They began from both ends, but they also sunk a shaft from the top of the mountain down into the middle of the mountain and began to build out from bo inside both directions. So they really were building from all four ends uh, in order to make better progress. And so by using innovative things like that, they began to make progress across the mountains, but it was taking a huge amount of time. And of course, every winter they would face the, the snows in the mountains, which had become infamous because of the Donner Party years before. Uh, and so they knew what they were up against. And so they made a decision in November of 1866. The Central Pacific decided that they could not wait to keep building east until they completed all these tunnels. So they decided that they would haul what they needed over the mountains by hand and then start laying tracks to the east from the last of the tunnels down into the valley. Um, they took nitroglycerin, blasting powder, wagon trains with supplies, carts with rails. Chinese workers took three locomotives and pulled them over the mountains on lard greased skids. <laughs> and then in December, the snow hit. Donner Pass had 10 foot drifts that they had to dig through. The January, in January, these locomotives were dragged over the top of Summit Tunnel and headed down the east slope. A thousand Chinese workers cleared a 200 foot wide right of way path, which included clearing trees that were eight feet in diameter, blowing out the stumps and grading what was left. They were stopped from January of April to April of 1867 by blizzards. They became, by their own accounts, Arctic moles who lived underneath the snow for several months. But they over the mountains and they began building tracks down the hill towards a place called Reno, Nevada, where they were going to come out the other side of the mountains. In 1867, both sides had really, both the Union Pacific and the Central Pacific, had truly come to recognize what they were doing and began to understand what it was going to take to build this railroad in a timely fashion. And then in the spring, massive floods hit both railroads taking out hundreds of small trestles, taking out some of those grades that I showed you in that previous uh, picture, uh, and in many ways derailing the whole process for some time ahead. But slowly but surely, they began to plot on. I mentioned the Chinese workers. They're part of that story that I think many people know of the Central Pacific. I want to show you this is a chart showing how many Chinese workers were employed by the Central Pacific Railroad over the course of those few years. And you can see that it actually peaked as they were trying to get up into the mountains and beginning to build those tunnels in mid-1866 and early in, into early 1867 is when the largest number were employed. Um, at one point, the local uh, lumber interests realized that Chinese workers were amongst the best that could be employed. They did not complain. They worked very hard. And they did what they were told, essentially. They were good workers, and they were solid. And once they were proven as workers, the lumber interests tried to lure the Chinese workers away from the Central Pacific and promised them higher wages. So much so that in 1867, in something that very few people know about, the Chinese workers on the Central Pacific actually struck for higher wages and asked to be paid the same amount that they could be paid by the lumber interests. And at this point, the big four decided that they could not let this, the, the momentum that had been built up in 65 and 66 stop. So they said to the Chinese workers, you were up in the middle of the Sierra Mountains 
What exactly are you going to eat while you're on strike? Come and talk to us when you get hungry enough. And they simply waited. And after a couple of weeks, the Chinese workers came back. And at that point, the Central Pacific did give them a small raise, so they were, didn't want small groups of these Chinese workers going off and working for the lumber interest. But uh, the, the Chinese workers proved to be um, absolutely indispensable in doing this backbreaking labor as the Central P Pacific worked its way through um, those western mountains, through the Sierras, and made their way um, towards the plains to the east. So let me see if I've gotten ahead of myself on uh, pictures here. Oh. Here are some photographs of actual some of the so-called coolies, the Chinese workers. Um, it is not known how many uh, died during the construction of the Central Pacific. Those, were, those records, it was not in the best interest of the Central Pacific to keep really careful records of things like that. Uh, frankly, of any workers, there are not good records of how many Irish or Italian or German workers died building the Union Pacific either. Um, it was not that sort of time, right? And so we don't really know, but we know that there was a considerable death toll, uh, particularly working in the mountains. There were cave-ins. Uh, it was very dangerous uh, work and uh, quite a bit of suffering. In 1868, uh, the Union Pacific reached its highest point. It went across Sherman Summit in the mountains in April, reached Evanston, Wyoming for the winter, uh, Central Pacific reached Lakes Crossing, which was renamed Reno in May of 1868. So, so many Western cities that we now associate with the Western United States really do have an important connection with this early railroad. Um, what is remarkable in some ways is how quickly these people who by in 1865 were bumbling and trying to find their way, how quickly they really became efficient and developed methods to build on a scale that really would have been unthinkable before this project began. And perhaps no story I could tell is a better one than what happened in April of 1869. The completion of the Transcontinental Railroad was coming close to hand. In fact, by this point, the two railroads were actually grading past each other because the point where they were going to meet was not going to be chosen, it had not yet been chosen by Congress, and because each railroad was getting land and money per mile, they both wanted to make their terminus as far as they could, right? And so for several miles, they went right by each other. If you go to Golden Spike National Monument today, you can see the two grades across from each other on the same hillside. Um, but when the railroads began approaching each other, uh, Crocker, one of the big four, had made a bet with Thomas Durant, and he had bet him $10,000, an enormous personal bet at the time, that, a, that one of his crews could lay 10 miles of track in one day. And, and Durant said that the Union Pacific could lay 10 miles of track in one day, and Crocker said they couldn't. And so April 28, 1869 was the date that was set. Um, everyone came out to see it. Crocker came out from Sacramento. The Casement brothers, who had come up with the idea of the construction uh, train, were there. In fact, they wanted to watch how this was going to be done because they realized their job was about done with the Transcontinental Railroad. They were going to go off and build other railroads, and they were always looking for some tip on how people were efficiently building railroads. So they wanted to see, how is this going to be done? Like, how is this feat going to be accomplished? Um, men from both sides took the day off and they watched. Chinese workers brought the rails forward. Eight Irishmen whose names are committed to history, Sullivan, Daly, Kennedy, Joyce, Shea, Elliott, Colleen, and McNamara, lifted every single rail into place. And then they moved out of the way as spikers spiked them into place. They had laid six miles of track by 1.30 when they took a lunch break. By the end of the day, they had led 10 miles and 56 feet of track and had won the bet. This meant that during that day, those eight men had lifted 3,520 rails, placed them on 25,800 ties, and those eight men together had lifted 2 million pounds of rail, 
1,000 tons, meaning that they each lifted 125 tons or 250,000 pounds of rail during the course of that one day. It not only speaks to the personal strength of those men, it speaks to the organizational power that both those railroads had come to have by the time that this railroad was nearing its completion uh, near the end. And so I have a couple of pictures here, by the way. They're also great. I think they're a great, fo a great photographic record of building this railroad. Uh, a modern day version of that sign still stands just west of Promontory Summit, uh, Utah. Uh, there it is today at the National Park. Um, this is, to me, one of the greatest railroad photographs ever taken in all of American history. This is the Union Pacific Green, Green River, Wyoming, with that iconic sort of western landscape that is snow in the background. They are building the main trestle, which they're testing with an engine. This is called a shoe fly. This is a temporary way they got across the river. I would not have wanted to be the first engine across that shoe fly, to be honest. Um, it seems to be a little bit, uh, I'm a little dubious of its strength. But then, of course, they're building a more permanent uh, trestle up here. Um, this, perhaps, to me, says more about what the railroad did was this is Leland Stanford's train, Leland Stanford being one of the big four. This is his train heading west to the ceremony at Promontory Summit. And because the railroad is not yet technically completed, there goes a wagon train of migrants heading west to the west coast because they could not yet travel by rail, although a few weeks later, if they had the money, they could have. But they could not yet. So in some ways, this is the passing of an era, the era of the covered wagons, the era of that, the 49ers heading west, all those people heading across the Great Plains, that of course would continue in smaller numbers, but now the railroad would make that older form of transcontinental tra uh, travel obsolete in very significant ways. So it was decided that Promontory Summit, Utah, would be where the two railroads would meet. Sometimes you hear Promontory Point, that's technically further south. That's the point that juts out into the Great Salt Lake. Um, that is, in fact, uh, I wrote that's, uh, that's 30 miles south of the actual site. So if you want to be technically correct, it's Promontory Summit. Uh, they were, the competing grades are still there today. Um, there was a, an elaborate ceremony. And I want to talk a little bit about the ceremony because I think it's sort of cotton legend. Here's this iconic photograph again, the one that most people, I would hope, would recognize as being the, the laying of the golden spike and the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad in May of 1869. What's interesting is that photograph has become so iconic that it is over and over the one that you will see. And just to check in the digital age in which we live, if a photo is truly iconic, I went to Wikipedia and looked up Promontory Summit, Utah, and that's the photograph that accompanies the article. That's what stands for iconic in this because honestly, if my students were going to go look up one photograph, they would go look up the Wikipedia article and that's what they would find. But it is not the only photograph taken that day. So what we have here is from the left, uh, we are looking north. From the left, the Central Pacific engine has come all the way from Sacramento. From the right, the Union Pacific engine has come from Omaha, and they have met there right where the Golden Spike ceremony is going to take place. There were, however, however, other photographs that are much less known, but I think are sometimes revealing. So here is another view of that same moment. Here we actually see the Central Pacific Railroad. That's the Jupiter is the engine that they use. So we're looking mostly east down the line of the Union Pacific train, and we have the Central Pacific train here in the foreground. Here's another view before the engine's pulled quite so close, and it shows exactly where the golden spike's going to be laid. A few minutes later, you can see everyone sort of gathered around, and we're looking east out into the vast expanses um, to the east there. Um, here's one other view. I think this must have been a trick, because if you remember what photography was like at the time, the fellow who took this photograph would have had to take that big, bulky camera with a glass negative and gotten what I believe he's up on top of the locomotive cab and exposed this photograph. That was no easy thing. 
he, he didn't, you know, he, I think sometimes my students think that you just go up on top of something and just go click and you have a nice picture of it. It, of course, was much more complicated to do. So he captured this moment again in time. Here, we're on the Union Pacific engine looking to the west towards the Central Pacific and the Jupiter, and we can see some tents there in the background. So we see a little bit more of what's going on. One of the interesting myths about Promontory Summit is that uh, none of the Chinese workers who worked on the Central Pacific Railroad were present that day. That's why you can't just use one photograph because here's another photograph of that day and here are three of the Chinese workers who have been invited to be a part of the ceremony. You see they're, they've been marked with an arrow here in this picture. There were Chinese workers there that day and in fact uh, at the time their role in the building of the railroad was celebrated. This I'll leave you, I, I know you know how to read, so I'm going to leave you to read this article that appeared uh, at the time. And Mr. Strobridge, by the way, was the construction engineer for the Central Pacific. And Victory was a nearby camp. So at the time, their contribution was known and appreciated and understood. Um, so um, it was, you know, and then the verbiage of the day right there invited the Chinaman who had been brought over from Victory. Um, you know, that's the way they were spoken of. But at the time, it was recognized that they played a big part in this railroad and in the making of the Transcontinental Railroad. If you go there today, and I would encourage you, it's not an easy site to get to. Um, I don't know how to describe how to get there. Go to Salt Lake and head north and then head west on a dirt road for 30 miles. But you can get there. And um, if you go there today, oops. Every day at noon, exact replicas of the Jupiter and the 119 come out, steam en operating steam engines come out, and they come together at noon, and they recreate that ceremony from 1869. Yes, and so you can see that to this day. Now, what's interesting is that rail line was taken up in 1942 because it was a branch line by that point, not the main line, and it's rail was used during World War II, the iron was needed, and so the steel was, steel was needed. So the line was pulled up in 1942 during the Second World War, but in the 60s, they created this national park and they laid about a half mile of track back. And you can see this is the, they, both these little engines live in a little shed off to the right, and the CP engine goes around and it comes and they recreate every day. They come together and blow their whistles and recreate. <laughs> And it's interesting the way to think that history continues to influence the present because, because that is the iconic photograph, right? That is basically trying to recreate what we saw in those photographs. The visitor center is behind us. In some ways, it would have made a lot more sense to put the visitor center on the other side of the tracks, but it would have messed up the photograph. How many people, I wonder, have come just like I did this is not my photograph, I stole this from someone else online, but I took, when I went there, I took a photograph exactly like this, and I'm sure everyone else has too. And if there was a big visitor center in the background, it would mess the whole scenery up, right? So they built the visitor center behind us to the south of uh, the Golden Spike moment, right? Uh, and you, if you go there today, this is a map of the park, and you actually, what you can do is, this is the little part that's preserved, you can actually drive out to the west on an access road and then drive back along the original right-of-way. And you can see where they dug through stone and, and where they made their way through the rocks. And you can ride on the old, what would have been the old railroad line back to the visitor center. And so and here you can see the competing grades as they work their way east from Promontory. So it's an interesting site. If you ever get a chance to get out by Golden Spike National Historic Site, uh, I would encourage you to do that. I think it's a, I think it's a fascinating, um, Park. Now, I want to talk about the ceremony itself just a little bit. Um, another way in which this showed a modern America coming to the fore was that in order so that all Americans, well, many Americans could know what was going to happen on May 10th, 1869 with the driving of the Golden Spike, they created a moment. They took a telegraph line and they connected it to a spike which was in the last, not the ceremonial golden spike, which they weren't going to hit because it was gold and it would have probably, it would, it's not very hard, but an actual spike, they put a telegraph line around it 
and then he put a telegraph line around the, the, the hammer. And then what happened was when they hit it with a hammer, it would make a connection and a telegraph line would go dot all across the country. And they opened all the telegraph lines so that everything was open so everyone could hear at every station could hear that dot and know that the, the last spike had been put into the railroad. And that was something that was only possible really at this time period as the telegraph system was becoming uh, pretty complete. And it led to a little bit of problems because until that dot, there was nothing but dead air. And so you were supposed to keep the line open, but telegraphers all over the United Steps, Steps states kept jumping in and saying, did it happen yet? Did it happen yet? By Morse code. And so I have some of what was sent out of Promontory Summit that day during the event. These are some of the uh, telegraphic messages sent out. To everybody, keep quiet. When the last spike is driven at Promontory, we will say done. Almost ready. Hats off. Pray, prayer is being offered. We have got done praying. <laughs> Speaker spoke and then the spike tapped and then they tapped out okay. Cannons fired from the Presidio in San Francisco to Battery Park in New York. All over the United States, Americans celebrated this incredible technological feat. Now, there's a little bit of a story about the Golden Spike that you may know. It is, the, the legend is that these two men, Stanford, Leland Stanford, representing the Central Pacific, and Thomas Durant came forward and were asked to drive the last spike and to swing the hammer. And they swung and they missed. And everyone had a good laugh because they don't know what they're doing because they're a bunch of stuffed shirts who don't know how to swing a, a hammer. There is really good evidence that this is entirely made up. It comes completely from one reminiscence written by a man named Alexander Topons in 1923, and we're not even sure he was there. Um, there is no other first-hand account. No one who is in this picture said that either of those men swung the hammer nor that they missed. This fellow left behind a reminiscence. If anybody had a view of what was going on, he did, and he didn't mention the darn thing. <laughs> it reminds me a little bit of what the newspaper editor said in The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. This is the West, sir. When the legend becomes fact, print the legend. <laughs> Um, I think that probably what they did was to make this connection, they simply reached down with this hammer, which would be hard to wield with this string around it, and simply tapped it to make the done. I think that's all that happened. But what a wonderful story. These suits, these men who financed the railroad but didn't really know how to swing them all, had missed, and ha, 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 someone else had to come forward, right? It's such a good story that it was necessary to invent it. Okay. So finally, what is the significance of the, the Transcontinental Railroad? Um, there was a lot of graft. I could have spent a whole other presentation explaining things like the Credit Mobilier scandal. The Union Pacific directors essentially created a dummy corporation that it then contracted with to actually build the railroad, but was owned by the directors of the Union Pacific, who then Credit Mobilier bought the supplies and constructed the railroad and then increased the charges, which they then charged the Union Pacific, which then took a further profit. The whole thing was sort of a, a Ponzi scheme. To keep everybody quiet, they then began to hand out Credit Mobilier stock in Congress. When this was exposed in 1872, it went all the way up to Grant's Vice President, Schuyler Colfax. It probably cost James G. Blaine the presidential election in 1884, which is why you've never heard of James G. Blaine. Um, in some ways, those scandals came to symbolize what came to be called the Gilded Age, uh, a time of pools, trust, corruption uh, that so uh, characterized the late 19th century. And many of those techniques were in, in some ways pioneered by the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. The railroad forever changed the West. It made it easy for hunters to penetrate the West and to begin to destroy the great bison herds. 
Indeed, the buffalo herd of the West was cut in two by the Transcontinental Railroad into northern and southern herd. Oftentimes, hunters shot the buffalo from trains, uh, either took just simply their, their, uh, their coats for blankets or their tongue as a delicacy and left the rest of them to rot. Um, this was a practice, this was encouraged by the U.S. Army because they knew the Plains Indians could only survive if they had the buffalo to depend on. To give you some idea of what happened soon after, I need only really show you this photograph. That is from the 1880s and those are buffalo skulls um, being sent as fertilizer to the east. They're going to be ground up and used as fertilizer. Eventually, Railroads themselves came to dominate the national economy. You can see the land grants here. In 1883, the railroads themselves demanded that the United States adopt standardized time zones, which went into effect in that year. You can see those four time zones there. Really, the railroads had a lot to do with the coming of standardized time. Um, other railroads would be built who were transcontinentals the Southern Pacific in 1881, Northern Pacific in 1883, Great Northern in 1893, the Milwaukee Road in 1909, and two Canadian transcontinentals as well. In some ways, this building era cemented the railroad's power in American life for nearly a century. Um, you know in a way that, oh, that's interesting, that's not going to show up in this presentation. There's a map showing there were a whole lot of railroads in the United States in 1918, so I'll just do that, my, I'll just do that myself. Uh, and then decline somewhat afterwards. By 1916, there were 250,000 miles of railroads in the United States. There are 138,000 left today. So, in many ways, the Transcontinental Railroad influenced American life and had long-term impacts on the American experience. And I do have one last thought about the Transcontinental Railroad. You know, as with all such ventures, there are winners and losers. And I don't want to downplay that in what I'm about to say. There is no accurate account, as I mentioned, of the number of men who died building this railroad. The Chinese fared poorly after the railroads were built. I should have probably said more about the devastating impact of this railroad on American Indians and their ability to remain independent in the West. And yet there was also something undeniably heroic about all this. Building an engineering feat few had thought possible at the outset. There have been other great moments where Americans proved what their minds and bodies could do. For example, I would suggest the economic, you know, this is the Transcontinental Railroad. I would mention the economic miracle that defeated the Axis in World War II the space race and the moon landing that characterized the United States during the Cold War. These were heroic feats that helped bring unity and a sense of purpose to the American people. While I have no idea what today's equivalent might be, as a historian, I study the past, not predict the future. Perhaps the U.S. would benefit from another seemingly impossible and yet ultimately achievable project because in those moments, I would argue, are revealed America at its best. Thank you very much. I don't know, several days. Um, and they were running, you know, they were running by relay, right? Yeah, so it was right. almost continuous. I do not know exactly how long it took, though, to be honest. Second yeah. question, um, on your first map, yes. you had a little green section going from Sacramento west to the Pacific. Right. Oh, so, yeah, so eventually, you know, the, the railroad didn't even reach San Francisco for quite a while. That was a later extension. Uh, which required, they were, they were sending cars by ferry early on across from Oakland. And it was going to San Francisco that way. And eventually a line was built in from the south. And so what's interesting is we use that term transcontinental railroad so loosely. And yet in many ways that's an imperfect, the railroad bridge across the Missouri would not be built until 1869. And so um, it's a transcontinental railroad in the dream of Americans. 
more than in the reality of getting on a train and never getting off till you get to the other coast. That's, but it meant a lot, I think, in tying the West Coast back to the rest of the United States. So symbolically, it was really important. Uh -huh. But yes, that's a good point. I only went to Sacramento, technically, which is not, for those of you who've been to California, is not on the, Atlanta, uh, not on the Pacific Ocean by any means, right? <laughs> that's absolutely the case. That's a very good point. Well, partly they would get that money released. They were getting 16,000, 32,000, 48,000 a mile. They would get that released upon the grading of a mile of roadbed. And so they were constantly receiving grants from the government. And then they were also getting land grants, which they could sell to actual settlers. So that was part of the way. And then they had 30 year 6% bonds, which they could sell to the public based on how many miles they had, too. And in some ways, that still wasn't as much money as they might have wanted at different times. Um, you know, because of the limited amount of time, uh, that didn't seem attractive enough. So they, uh, in 1864, they made the terms of those bonds a little more attractive. They gave the government second lien instead of first lien on the mortgages. So the bonds of the railroad sort of had first claim, and therefore people then wanted to buy those bonds a little bit more. But it was a near thing. Uh, there were many people who thought that at some point, this would all be exposed as a house of cards, and the whole thing would collapse. But um, I, I also, by the way, the other way they did it sometimes is they didn't pay the workers. Um, I, I didn't have time for this story. Durant is heading west towards Promontory Summit, and all of a sudden, his private railroad car, he had a private little train with an engine and a railroad car, gets put into a siding. And he says, what's going on? And one of his window get, windows gets broken, and this group of Irish workers show up, and they say, we haven't been paid. You owe the workers here $200,000. Uh, when you pay it, we'll remember how to get your train off this side. <laughs> and so Durant panics. He needs to get to promontory for the, for the uh, ceremony. And so he does two things. He wires these for $50,000. If you know, if I can pay him a quarter of it, that probably would be good enough. And he also notifies the nearest military fort. Oh my gosh, the workers have gone crazy. Send the cavalry, right? And uh, they eventually work things out. The 50,000 proves to be enough, and he gets sent on his way. But at times, it's a very near thing. And so they're always right teetering on the bank, on the edge of bankruptcy. But eventually, because of the land grants, these railroads will prove extremely profitable. The big four became incredibly, became four of the largest robber barons of the era, became these, or captains of industry, if you prefer, right? <laughs> became bigger, the largest businessmen of the, uh, of the Gilded Age. A, a story I'm just going to have to tell about Leland Stanford very quickly. So at the end of his life, he helps endow Stanford University. And we all know, while that is good work, he's also trying to have a certain respectability, right? And so you may not know this, but until 1970, Stanford University's mascot, where they were called the Indians. And in 1970, it was decided that mascot needed to be changed. And they asked college students at Stanford in 1970 what they should change it to. And the student body voted for the, Stan uh, the Stanford Robber Barons. <laughs> and suggested that the guy with the cigar from Monopoly should run out with a bag with a dollar sign on it and run around the field during timeouts. <laughs> the board of directors, realizing that poor Leland was probably spinning in his grave at the whole idea, decided on the Cardinal. You may know that the Stanford is called the Cardinal instead. Oh, how I wish they were the Stanford Robber Barons, but I guess that's not to be, okay? It's, uh, Duke did the same thing, but anyway, all right, okay. All right. The way corruption and progress often go together, is it hopelessly idealistic to think it could be otherwise? Um, nothing fuels progress like a nice little profit, right? I mean, that's, and honestly, in this case, there were so many people who thought that this project was going to fail that probably a little graft and corruption helps people get over their fears about ultimate failure. So maybe it is idealistic to think that this might, what I could say is in the middle of the 19th century, it is very idealistic to think that something like this would be bought. If you know Tammany Hall or some of the other hijinks going on in American politics in the 19th century, 
it's unlikely that this is going to be a completely honest operation. I think that probably is a little naive. I'd agree with you. Yeah. Although, in some ways, they pioneered and perfected techniques of graft and corruption that are, <laughs> Thomas Durant in particular, that are just stunning. So. <laughs> How did the Chinese get involved in the labor group? They were, well, some of them were encouraged to come over, were brought over early on because of the need for labor, particularly in the West Coast. Mm -hmm. And um, they were brought over in large numbers. And then, of course, once the railroads are built, then America stops that, right? So there's the Chinese Exclusion Act in the 1880s that cuts that off and then denies them citizenship for a while. But um, without that labor, the central, I'll say this, without that labor, uh, the Central Pacific would probably have never made it to the eastern border of California before the Union Pacific would have come chugging to the west, right? <laughs> it made a real difference. Uh, and, those, and, and what's interesting is, as workers, they were recognized as being tremendously hard workers who did not complain and did not shirk. Were the Chinese uh, sent back home? after this, or did they become citizens? They did not become citizens. They could not become a citizen of the United States until 1942. Um, so you, and, and Chinese uh, in immigration in the United States was cut off in 1882, 1883. Um, and so they lived in sort of a limbo where they lived here, but they didn't, uh, uh, California passed laws that made it difficult for people of Asian ancestry to own land, for instance, the Japanese and Chinese couldn't own land in California before World War II. So uh, it was a rough life. Many of them continued in menial labor thereafter. Some of them went home, by the way, when they weren't, weren't able to reunite with their families because they often couldn't bring their wives over, for instance. And so sometimes they went back because there was no realistic chance to ever regain their families. I wanted to make a comment on the Chinese workers. Uh, through my reading, the Chinese workers were healthier than the yep. other workers because they boiled their water and drank tea. For tea, that's and correct. And the other people drank their water out of the stream. And of course, we know what happens to streams and animals and feces, so they were that's, sick. That's 100% <laughs> right. There was greater health. Um, I also have to say that the Chinese, for the most part, uh, did not, and, and by the way, this is not a statement on any particular ethnic group, it's just true of Americans generally, they did not drink nearly as much alcohol as other workers did either, which is not necessarily good for you in large amounts either, right? Correct. And so, but there weren't a lot of good alternatives, and boiling water is a really good way to stay healthy for the tea. Yeah, as a matter of fact, what they really demanded was tea. That was one thing they really, tea and rice was largely what they lived on. And both those items are boiled in the process, so they end up being very healthy in that sense, right? And they were healthier diets, too. They were also, even, I, I didn't say, even along the railroad, um, they would sometimes plant little gardens because they, they had a diet that was much more based in vegetables <laughs> than, you know, other people. So, yes, it's, uh, and allowed them to work for a long period of time. So they were on sort of the Mediterranean diet long before uh, anybody else was. I had a question about the slide that you had with the... Chinese laborers? Okay. Yeah. Was that a total? Like I said, total for the Central Pacific. So that's right. Every month they added that many. Oh, more? that's the total working in that month for the railroad. So it would really fluctuate. Yes. Right it mostly months. went up and down, but there was some month to month fluctuation. That's right. That's a long way back, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> there we go. There we go. So there is some fluctuation. Like now, this, for instance, this is where. Um, the Central Pacific ran out of money in May of 1866, and some of those men went to work for lumber companies for a month, and then they figured things out. But that was the height. Is I think the height is right there in April of 1866, and that's a lot of the drilling of the tunnels and and the fill, and also uh, Chinese workers were often brought over the edge of precipices and then put the nitroglycerin into the side of hills and then would be pulled up in baskets. And so if you look this up etymologically, there is absolutely no evidence that this is 100% true. But it is claimed that to hell in a handbasket and not a Chinaman's chance comes from these Chinese workers being sent over and given nitroglycerin. And then you have to pull them up before the thing goes off. And if you look it up, if you look it up in lexicons, it'll say it's uncertain whether that's the actual beginning. But you hear that again and again and again. So I'm not sure whether that's true or not. But that's what one theory of where those come from is. It was a very dangerous job, whether that's where the thing came from or not. I've got a question. Yeah. Um, 
the basic technology or engineering for the rails themselves, is that American or did that come from Europe? Came from Britain. Britain really uh, is the, the technological innovator in a lot of things. Uh, by the middle of the 19th century, Americans are starting to innovate, but say the beginning of locomotive technology and rail technology is really developed in England uh, originally on colliery rails, uh, rails that bring coal drawn by horses out of the coal mines is the original idea of these little cars on the rails. Uh, Americans though did adapt a lot of things and, and particularly uh, by the late 19th century are, what Americans are good at is scaling up. Uh, Americans needed huge expanses of rails in a way that other countries didn't. So they had to learn to do things like how, an, how, a, how a corporation operates over a thousand miles and how systems of management really are American innovations. A lot of the technology comes from Great Britain as adapted for use in that way. It's a great question though. Do we have any more questions? Oh, assume that the Civil War played a, a great role in their ability to do some of these things yeah. in that railroad. The organizational learnings going across rivers, uh, engineering feats that they probably learned during that, that period. Um. Yeah, well, a little bit. Grenville Dodge served in the Union Army, for instance. Um, uh, the, a lot of it also came from pre-war railroad building as well. Uh, the Casement Brothers were building railroads in Ohio and Michigan before the Civil War, who developed the construction train. Uh, and a lot of them had, the Big Four had no railroad building experience before the Central Pacific. They had largely been grocers. You know, the people who got rich in the gold rush were the people who sold supplies to the miners who never found the mother load, right? So a lot, they were actually largely involved in, but yes, and certainly uh, the U.S. military railroad during the Civil War did learn how to put up trestles very quickly and things like that. So there is definitely a connection. Ironically, then the war also slowed down getting to this project because material and manpower was off in the Union Army. Yep, in the back. Um, based on your photographs and stuff, it looks like the original that's that's a fantastic question in fact the Union Pacific was building so fast to the West trying to make money that in the weeks following the Golden Spike ceremony they relayed several hundred miles of track to better standards so what was the Transcontinental Railroad on May 10th, 1869 was largely replaced in the coming months with better rail and, and, and so yeah, a lot of it was put together very quickly, very temporary, just get the, get the grade down, right? The money's to be made in laying the track, not in laying it well. And, but then over time, if you want revenue, you really need to build a better, better railroad. And then as you begin to get revenue, you have money to reinvest in infrastructure and to build a better physical plant. And that goes on from then until, I should say, Union Pacific still exists as a railroad. Um, it is as close to us as, uh, well, that one line, the Adams line runs through Adams, Wisconsin, right? The old Chicago Northwestern, that's Union Pacific today. So just south of us, when you head south on the, uh, if you go over to 39, head south on the interstate, it's that railroad bridge you, you go under, it's the first one south of Plover. So uh, that's Union Pacific uh, through acquisition. So that railroad still exists to this very day. Um, all the other railroads I mentioned are long gone. They've been merged and combined, and Central Pacific went away pretty quickly. But the Union Pacific still exists, and it is still based in Omaha, Nebraska, to this very day. So. With that, I think we okay. need to wrap it up. Fred will be okay. available at the front of the room sure. if you have other questions. Thank you. And one last. Yep.